And all God's people said, Amen. Let us worship the triune God. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who are in awe of him. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Almighty God, you have set our Lord Jesus at your right hand until you have made all of your enemies his footstool. You have sent out the rod of your strength to rule in the midst of your enemies. You have raised up countless missionaries and pastors and evangelists and teachers and fathers and mothers by your spirit, anointing them with the beauty of holiness. You have sworn and you will not repent. Jesus is Christ, our priest forever, and he is striking down all our enemies in his wrath. He is judging the nations. He will pile up their bodies, crushing the heads of every serpent king. He will triumph over every enemy until he comes at last to death itself, and the grave will shake in terror and give up its dead. And you will wipe every tear from every eye, and everything shall be made right, and all will be well. And so we worship you now, our Father, through Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, world without end, and amen. Amen. The text this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 7, starting at verse 9. These are the words of God. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit who gave this word to the prophets and the apostles. I pray the same spirit who, who inspired this word would be at work in our midst today, showing us how to apply it, how to put it into practice. Father, we pray for this in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. So those of you who are old-timers in the church here uh, know, and those of you who are newcomers are about to find out, that it's our practice around the first of the year, near the end of the year, or the beginning of a new year, to give a state of the church uh, message. And this state of the church message sometimes addresses national or even international issues. Sometimes it's more, uh, uh, addressed to local considerations. Sometimes it's addressed to the state of the church locally, our particular congregation. And that's what I'm going to be doing here this morning and uh, addressing our local circumstance. And I wanted to uh, deliver a message that would be sort of like a new members uh, class in a box, all right? So, and the, and the reason for this is over many years, the Lord has been uh, adding to our number as people have come here for various reasons to have their kids uh, put in Logos or their kids came to New St. Andrews and then the families followed after or they came for the church. We've had a steady stream of people uh, coming to Moscow to be part of the church and of course, they are all most welcome, but somebody over the course of the last year opened the floodgates and we've had a, a, a large number of new folks come in. And that means that uh, probably within the last year, 100 to 150 new people have um, come into our community and have joined us. And that the fact that they are all most welcome here does not alter the fact that some of them are thinking, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why I wasn't, anticip I wasn't anticipating that, or uh, why do they do that? That's an interesting, quirky thing. I've never seen that done before. What's, what's up with that? And so what I want to do is answer those sorts of questions. And the questions might go in various ways. I've, we've been growing in, in remarkable ways, and an essential part of that growth entails inevitable growing pains. Now, don't make the category mistake. Some pains are just pains, right? They're, they're not, 
they're not growing pains. It's somebody, this happened because somebody got into sin or someone had a bad attitude. But some uh, pains are, are inevitable growing pains, the sort of thing you see in the early chapters of Acts when the church exploded. And one of the first things that uh, arose was a dispute about the distribution among the, the Hellenistic widows and the, Hebra- the Hebrew-speaking widows. And there, what, how do we sort this out? And the first deacons were commissioned as a result of that to address that problem. That is an example of growing pains. Now, quite a few of you have joined our community within, just within the last year, and it seems to you, or it might seem to you, like you've jumped into the middle of a conversation that has been going on for 40 years, and you're thinking, what, what was that? What's the antecedent to that, or, or what is that about? But some of you newcomers might be puzzled over something else also. Where you came from, you might have been in a pretty Uh, desolate uh, church situation. You might have been in a pretty desolate circumstance. And uh, the sort of things that you got online or the publications you got from here, books or whatever, were sort of a lifeline to you. And you began to devour them and and to depend on them. And uh, you hung on every word, so to speak. And then when you got here, you were astonished to find that a bunch of people in the congregation were not nearly as up to speed as you were from... (laughs) far away. You, you, you knew when all the Bible studies were, and you knew where the parish meetings were, and you knew all of that. And the person who's lived here for 20 years is saying, what? Huh? What? So life is funny. Make sure you adjust for all the variables and do so without becoming judgy. Everybody's got their own circumstance. Everybody's got their own story. And what I want to do is explain some of those, some of the background that will help you interpret what is going on, to help you interpret uh, what our understanding is of what God is doing in our midst. Now, you might well wonder, what does this have to do with Samuel and the Philistines? I will tell you. So here in 1 Samuel 7, on the threshold of battle, the prophet Samuel interceded on behalf of Israel, and he was interceding with a sacrifice and with intense prayer. He's crying out to the Lord, and the Lord heard him, it says in verse 9. And in the very moment of offering up the ascension offering, or whole burnt offering, many of your translations say whole burnt offering, uh, there are different kinds of offerings in the Old Testament. There's the guilt offering, when you're, you're bringing an offering because of some sin you've committed, that's the guilt offering. Uh, there is the um, peace offering, that's where you offer something, that's the one sacrifice where the worshiper partook of the meat of the sacrifice, that was a communion offering. And there is the ascension offering or the whole burnt offering as here. The whole burnt offering is a consecration offering. It's a dedication offering where the whole animal is burnt and ascends into heaven in a column of smoke. The whole thing is dedicated to God. Also, incidentally, while I'm here, I should mention that the structure of our worship service, whenever those three offerings are mentioned in the Old Testament together, they always go in a particular order. And that order is guilt offering first, whole burnt offering or ascension offering second, and then third is the peace offering. That's the order they come in, which is why we have in our worship service the confession of sin, which corresponds to the guilt offering early in the service, then the consecration uh, period where we're reading scripture and the sermon and that sort of thing uh, corresponds to the ascension offering, and then our communion table, we practice weekly communion, that corresponds to the peace offering where we sit down and share a meal with our Lord. So guilt offering, ascension offering, and peace offering. Anyway, Samuel is offering up an ascension offering, and he's right in the middle of offering it up, and the Philistines approach the Israelites to do battle in verse 10. But the Lord responded from heaven. The Lord, so Samuel's praying, and the Lord is answering almost immediately. The Lord responded from heaven with loud thunder, so much so that the Philistines were thrown into confusion, and Israel overcame them, verse 11. In other words, the Philistines were thrown by the thunder, and the Israelites weren't. So the Israelites knew, had, had some awareness of what was going on, they took the opportunity. The Philistines were thrown into confusion, and the, the men of Israel seized control of the situation, and they drove the Philistines back as far as the place called Beth-Kar, verse 11. Then, in response to all of this, 
Samuel, in his gratitude, set up a memorial stone. He set up a, a, a monument stone, and he named it Ebenezer saying that the Lord had helped them to this point, verse 12. The word Ebenezer literally means stone of help. So what happened is they beat the Philistines back to this particular place. Samuel was most grateful for this great work that God had uh, given to them, and he set up a memorial saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. To this place God has given us help. This is the stone of help. Earlier in this narrative, when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured a few decades before by the Philistines, they took the Ark from the place called Ebenezer to their city of Ashdod. You remember that the Ark was at Shiloh, which is where Samuel grew up. Then uh, El uh, Eli's two sons took the Ark out to battle, and so the battle apparently took place near the, a town called Ebenezer, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured at, at that place and then taken back to Ashdod. You remember the Lord struck the Philistines with a number of afflictions, and they finally returned the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that previous battle had been lost as a real humiliation to Israel, and it was an indicator of their idolatrous faithlessness. Twenty years later, Samuel called on Israel to return to God with all of their hearts. That's verse 3 of chapter 7. Turn back to God. Come back to God. This is 20 years after the Ark of the Covenant had been lost and then returned. And they did. They responded to, they responded to Samuel's words. God granted them this victory, which Samuel then memorialized. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel, uh, uh, which is what we find out in verse 13. And this is why um, in that, that line that may have puzzled some of you in the hymn, it says, here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I have come. So setting up an Ebenezer, an Ebenezer stone, is setting up a rock of memorial. At, uh, it's setting up a monument saying, God has helped us to this point. And so I would like this message to serve as something of an introduction to our new members and a reminder for our old timers. Paul says in Philippians 3 that to say the same things over again is not a trouble for me and it's helpful for you. So if, you, if you've heard this before, it's simply an encouragement. If you've not heard it before, it is part of the orientation that we want to provide for you. Our congregation is alive and thriving. There is a lot going on. It's alive and it's thriving. It's a happening place. It's spiritually healthy. But I want to begin by noting that there were many, many occasions when it could have gone otherwise. And by otherwise, I mean going south, going, veering off into a ditch. There are, there are many occasions in the, in the life of this congregation over the last 40 years where we could have assumed room temperature. And what I mean by, well, never mind what I mean by. It might have gone otherwise. In other words, that we had numerous close calls. We are not here. We, we did not survive to this point. We did not make it this far because of our own wisdom, our own boyish good looks, our own cleverness, none of that. We, we made it this far because the Lord thundered from heaven. Um, it's not that we were so much better than the Philistines. It is that God is kind. If it, if it had been a matter of our own wisdom or capability, we would not be here. We would not be here. We have no right to still be here. By all rights, this shouldn't work. All right? What we're attempting, what we're trying to do um, in, in terms of human explanation, it, it, it shouldn't be functioning. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be working at all, and it certainly shouldn't be working as well as it is. Something else is going on. Something funny is going on. And what I want to address is my understanding from the Word of God of what that something is. What is it that we're emphasizing? What is it that God has brought us to emphasize that is having this impact? What is our Ebenezer stone? What are the things that we would point to? Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Why would you say the Lord has helped us to that? What, how? What are, you, what are you talking about? Number one, the first thing that I would, uh, I would want to emphasize is the centrality of worship. The centrality of worship. We believe that the most important thing that anyone here can do in the course of the week is to appear before the Lord in worship. We believe the most important thing you do all week long is what you're doing right this minute. 
in, in Hebrews 12, uh, verse 20, verses 28 and 29, it says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve, and the word underneath serve there is worship, whereby we may worship God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. When it says that God wants to be worshiped, when, when we're invited to worship God acceptably, uh, you may infer from this that it's possible to worship God unacceptably. If there's such a thing as acceptable worship, there is unacceptable worship. Unacceptable worship began very early on. That's what Cain offered to God. Cain brought unacceptable worship. Abel brought acceptable worship. The Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians talks about people who uh, treat the body harshly, and he calls it will worship. He, he says that there are things that people cook up. There are things that they think up, that they invent on their own, that they think sound and smell and act like very spiritual, very, very holy sorts of, well, that's surely God would be pleased with that, but there's nothing in the Word of God about it. And so they just invent something that strikes them as holy, and then they offer it to God. Surely God would like this. That's the way Cain was thinking. Surely God would like what I want to offer. Surely God wants to receive what I want to give. But worship doesn't work that way. God is the one being worshiped, and so he's the one who explains to us what he wants to receive in worship. And so we want to study the Bible, and we want to see what the Bible includes, what the Bible tells us to offer to him. And that means that if someone wanders in, and, and, and they're curious and not adversarial, not hostile, and they say, why do you do that? Or what's, the, what's all about, why do you have the scripture reading? Um, well, we want to say, well, because Paul tells Timothy that this is something you should do. Why, why do you address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Because it says to do that in Ephesians and Colossians. Why do you have this element of the service? Why do you have the Lord's Supper? Why, why, why this? Why this? Why this? We want to be able to answer the question from the Word and have our worship be acceptable worship. We want to worship God acceptably because God is a consuming fire. Now, God does not come first in an abstract way where someone comes up to you and says, what's first in your heart? And you say, Jesus, because you know that that's the right answer, right? Well, in my heart, Jesus comes first. No, Jesus comes first in practical, in practical, practical tangible ways. He comes first because we worship him on the Lord's day on the first day of the week. He comes first, and this is a, 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 one of the great transformations between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, it was six days and then a day of rest and day of worship. Uh, Leviticus 23 says that uh, the, the weekly Sabbath was a holy convocation. It was a, a day of gathering. So you have six days and then the convocation. Christians in the New Covenant gather on the first day of the week. We gather on the first day of the week and then the rest of the week follows. He comes first because our time of worship here should be thought of by you as laying the foundation stone for everything else that you will do during the course of the coming week. In other words, this is the most important thing you do all week, but it's not unrelated to the other things that you do all week. And what you do when you, when you pour the slab and then you come to build the walls, you want to build the walls in line with the foundation. You don't want to build the, the, pour the slab with the rectangle going this way and then build the house with the rectangle going that way. You want the, the, the shed or the building or the home to line up with the foundation. And that leads us to the next point. This is the interconnectedness of everything. So number one, number one is that worship is the most important thing you do. This is the key thing that you're doing all week. There's nothing in your life more important than what you're doing right this minute. You're worshiping God. You're here with your family. You've assembled before the, before the Lord and you say, here I am. I've confessed my sins. I've acknowledged it all to you. I've asked for your cleansing and I want to offer everything that I have to you. This is the, nothing else. Everything else is going to be out of joint unless you're doing that. Um, and you're doing that now, and that's good, and that's the way we want to keep it. And God appears to believe that, and, and we should therefore follow him in this, that we need to do something like this every seven days. This is, this is a, <laughs> seven days is about as long as we can go without, things start, without the wheels starting to come off. So every Lord's Day, the first day of the week, you appear before God, and you 
check everything. You, you, done, you run the diagnostics. You confess your sin. You, you go over the checklist. You, you uh, surrender the things that were creeping back into the wrong part of your heart. You surrender that to God. You renew your covenant with him. Not like, it, not like your covenant was going to run out, like it was a lease or something, but renewed the way a meal re- renews your physical life or sexual communion renews marriage. That's what, what we're dealing with in the Lord's Supper is a renewal of the covenant that sort of way. So, worship is very important, but this leads to the second point. Worship is not a disconnected important thing, like a diamond in a truckload of driveway gravel. If you had a big, uh, huge diamond in the middle of a truckload of driveway gravel, that'd be a very important stone. It'd be the most important stone in the whole truckload. But it would also be disconnected from all the other pebbles. It would be disconnected from the rest of the gravel. Your worship is crucial. Your worship is important and connected to absolutely everything else you might do. It's connected the same way the engine is central to the function of the car. In Colossians 1.17 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Everything holds together. Everything holds together in Christ. So Christ is not just central as a, an important, the most important thing, and then all these other disconnected things are somehow less important. No, it's, there's something else going on. We believe that all things in the universe are related to one another. Everything in the universe is, has a connection to everything else. It's in a universe, after all, and the relationship that they have is found in Christ. In fact, the only reason why the universe can be a universe is because of Christ, because Christ is Lord over all of it. God is sovereign, and therefore Christ is Lord. God is sovereign over all things, and therefore Christ is Lord over all things. If God were not sovereign over all things, then he could not have appointed Christ as the Lord over all things, which he did do. After Jesus died, and was buried and rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, God gave him universal dominion. God gave him, the, God put Jesus in charge of everything. Without Christ at the center, without Christ as Lord, you don't have a universe. A universe is actually a Christian concept. You, can, you have a una. You have something that ties it all together in, in much the same way that a university is a Christian invention. A university is a Christian invention because Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord of mathematics. Christ is Lord of geography. Christ is Lord of language. Christ is Lord of all, all of these things. And if you go up to the, uh, the University of Idaho today, now, is no longer a university because they have rejected Christ. And when you reject Christ, it, it, it's transformed from a university into a multiversity. They, everything comes apart. And they like to think it's diversity, but it's not diversity so much as it is fragmentation. If you've been of the, the, ad, uh, the ad building is a very beautiful building. And around the top of the building, you'll see these little, um, uh, what do you call them? Angles all the way around the edge of the building. And on the top of those angles used to be stone crosses all the way around, and they took them down, had to take them down because too Christian. And we're going to get rid of Christ, and when we get rid of Christ, what do we, what do we lose? We lose coherence. Everything, everything used to hang together because Christ was Lord of all. Now, today, the people in the ag, ag econ department don't have anything to do with the people in the physics department. The people in the physics par- department don't know what's going on in biology. The people in biology don't know what's going on in the English department. And the people in the English department don't know what's going on in the English department, which is, <laughs> which is another layer. And that's where a bunch of the trouble actually begins. If Christ is not Lord, if Christ is not Lord of all, then Christ is not the Lord at all. Christ is not a sovereign deity that you, a little plastic Jesus that you put inside your brain on the dashboard of your mind. That's not, he's not a limited, finite God. He's not a tiny God. He's not a little God. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he's the Lord of heaven and earth because he was crucified, was buried, rose again from the dead. God raised him up. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, God gave him universal dominion. So this means, and this is the glorious part, 
This means it, that it's not the case that your life is made up of all these disconnected and random parts and that discipleship consists of you surrendering all of these random parts that have nothing to do with each other to the Lord so that he could haul them all off to his divine salvage yard. God is not hauling the parts of your life off to some landfill. He's not hauling them off to some junkyard. That's not what's going on. He's not taking them to a place where true randomness reigns. No, in Christ, all the different aspects of your life fit together into one integrated whole. You've been, it's like uh, you got one of those um, gifts for Christmas that you had to assemble, and you've been making a hash of it. You're, you're trying, you, that, it all came in the same box, so you think that there has to be a way for this to go together, but it's not going together, and you've been spending a couple days on it, and the Lord comes and says, here, let me, let me do that. He spreads all the pieces on the table, and then he begins to assemble them, and they, and they do go together. That, that clicks into that, and that snaps together, and that goes together, and then the Lord occasionally says, what's this doing in here? you got somebody else's present. Uh, apart from somebody else's present mixed in with this. And so he puts, it off, puts that off to the side. There are things that get put off to the side, but he starts assembling your life and it starts to fit together. Your life comes together into an integrated whole such that Sunday has something to do with Tuesday and Tuesday has something to do with Thursday. And Thursday has something to do with the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. All of it is connected. All of it's connected. And then in Christ... In, the, in his body, your life is being fitted together with all the other lives that are being fitted together. Jesus is not just doing this for you. He's doing this for everyone here. Everyone here is having things, pieces put back together. Everyone here is having their lives assembled. And then we come together in formal worship on the first day of the week. And the Lord is knitting us together. This is what love looks like. This is what koinonia love naturally does. And the New Testament explains it and is very explicit about this. Um, in Ephesians 4 and in Colossians 2, in Ephesians 4.14, 4, this is what Paul says. From whom the whole body, that's you, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This assembly is called love. The assembly of your life is called love. The assembly, the reassembly of your family is called love. And then God takes your family and this other family and he assembles them, he brings them together. He knits them together and that's called love. All of this is God knitting his body together in love. And remember that as we're being knit together, as we grow together, we are not above using the, tool, the tools and the events that the Lord has granted to us. And this includes everything from our new church software that helps us stay connected to one another, to our beer and psalms events, from our shared meals, to helping the less fortunate through our deacons fund, and so on. Expect everything to be gathered to together, expect everything to be assembled, brought together somehow, some way. But it will be gathered together in an orderly way, and because God is doing it through Jesus, it will be done in a loving way. God is getting rid of the things that need to be gotten rid of. The only, basically, the only, things, the only things that God is going to tell you to get rid of, the things that he tells you to mortify, the things that he tells you to kill, the things he tells you to kill are the things that are killing you. And he, he is... He is rejecting, excising from your life, getting out of your life, all of the things that are death to you. Because he is the bringer of life. He is the one who brings life to you. Now, I said that this, uh, this all happens in an orderly way. And this means, this entails government. Self-government is the fruit of regeneration. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and among them is self-control. Self-control is a fruit of regeneration, and self-control, self-government, is foundational to every other form of God-given government. I'm speaking here of the three governments that God has established. Uh, we have the authority to establish, you know, you can start a ham radio club, you can start a quilters club, you can start a dance club, and you can 
draft bylaws and, and set up a form of government. Since it's a creation of yours, you have the authority to set up the government however you please. But God has established three institutions, and since he established them, he establishes the government of these institutions. These three governments are the government of the family, the government of the church, and the government of the state. Genesis 2.18, when God brings Eve to Adam and presents when God gives away the first bride, he is establishing family government. Adam knows that that's what's happening when he says, for this cause a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two become one flesh, which Jesus quotes as the foundation of every marriage. God, God is at work in the formation of every new family. Genesis 2.18. So that's a God, one God-given government. Um, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, Jesus ascended into heaven, and he gave gifts to men, it says. And these gifts that he gave to men include apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. What did, what did Jesus give to us when he, after he ascended into heaven? He gave church government. He established church government. That's Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And then God established the government of the state, Romans 13, 1 and 2. Every authority that exists, exists because God established it. God established the civil magistrate. He does not bear the sword for nothing. You ought, not, you ought to be respectful of um, law enforcement because God himself established that government. Now, it's true that God, God established the government of the family and the government of the church and the government of the state. But it's also true that God is the God over all of these governments and none of these governments are God. So the father is the head of the home, but he's not the God of the home. The, the pastor and the elders are, the, are responsible for the congregation, but they're not God in the congregation. And the civil magistrate is God's appointed deacon, a deacon of wrath, it says, uh, a, a servant answerable to God for what, um, what they do. They're supposed to reward the righteous and punish the wrongdoer. And to the extent they're doing that, they're answerable to God as God's deacon. And you're to honor and respect that. Uh, in, unfortunately, in our deranged times, many of these governments have gone off the rails, and instead, in, instead of the magistrate rewarding the righteous and punishing the wrongdoer, they're punishing the righteous and re re rewarding the wrongdoer, and that's another question for another time. But these three governments are established by God. The state is the ministry of justice, the state is the ministry of justice. The church is the ministry of word and sacrament. The family is the ministry of health, education, and welfare. The state's job is to make it safe for you to walk across town at 2 in the morning. That's their ministry. That's their task. That's their assigned responsibility. The church is supposed to explain the word of God to you and, and uh, baptize and to uh, feed you the word of God and feed you the, the bread and the wine. The family is the ministry of health, education, and welfare. Among other things, this means that you and your family all belong here at worship because you're all part of what is going on. The church has an essential role in this, a central role, an essential role, but it's like a cathedral in the middle of a town that has a central place in that town. The rest of the town is part of the kingdom. The church is at the center of town in this metaphor. The church is at the center of town, but the church is not the town. It's the church at the center and the kingdom uh, throughout to the city limits. All of it belongs to Christ, but not all of it belongs to the church. All of it belongs to Jesus, but not all of it belongs to the church. Expect this to show up in nicknames. One of the things that some people, uh, outsiders, are afraid of is that, you know, when they look at Christ Church or they hear about Christ Church or they tell stories about Christ Church and they think it's sort of the death star of Moscow and, it, and everybody... Um, everybody is. Everybody runs their businesses, but they're all basically sock puppets for the elders and and whatnot. No, no, not <laughs> no. Um, and sometimes the, this illusion is created by nicknames. Um, nicknames like Kirker, like the. Uh, the Kirkers do this, and the Kirker, that's a Kirker business, and that's a Kirker business. And that's well, make sure you make all the necessary adjustments. The, the nickname Kirker, I'll tell you where that came from. Uh, Kirker, back in the early days of computers, earlier days of computers, there were times when domain names had to, uh, you couldn't use extended 
uh, you had to limit the number of letters. And Christchurch didn't fit. So um, Christchurch was too big. And so the, sp the Scottish word for church is Kirk. And Christ Kirk did fit. And Christ Church didn't fit. And so we shortened it, Christ Kirk. That's why Christkirk.com. And so we shortened it so it would fit. And then we, so it took the name Christ Kirk. And then um, you all began being called Kirkers. And that's, it's, it's not a secret, there's not a secret um, password. There's not a, <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, a secret society. Kirkers can repair automobiles or cut hair or sell burgers, but that doesn't, does not mean that the church owns or controls any of that. It simply means that you're being taught to pursue whatever it is that God has given you to do with the glory of Christ and the good of his people in mind, as determined by Scripture. The church teaches you honesty. The church teaches you hard work. The church teaches you the need for craft competence. You need to be good at what you do. Whatever you do, you need to do it to the glory of God. You need to give yourself to the study of the Word of God. We, we exhort you and teach you at, uh, that, to that level, but we don't control any of, your, uh, any of your enterprises or your work or anything like that. If someone if someone complained, hey, so-and-so's running this shop and he's ripping people off, he's being dishonest, and, and I can show that he's being dishonest, then yes, someone would be, would be admonished for the dishonesty, but not, not for um, making your own business decisions your own way. So we teach honesty, hard work, all of that. On a related front, this is um, not exactly identical, but it's similar. When people see, when people see a large group of uh, folks who are singing together and worshiping together and laboring together and they love each other, it, it can be spooky. It can spook people. And they say, oh, everybody, everybody there believes the same thing. They're all, um, you know, Kirker bots. Well, our church's statement of faith, our church's statement of faith is the Westminster Confession of Faith. And the Westminster Confession of Faith re reflects the views of the church leadership. When you, if you're coming in from outside and you, want to, and you wanted to join the church, uh, you might think to yourself, because many churches do this, many churches say you can't be a member unless you subscribe to the church's statement of faith. Everybody in the church has to agree with everything in the statement of faith. Uh, that's not the way um, uh, we're, uh, we're historically Presbyterian. Presbyterians have not generally done it that way. The, the statement of faith tells you basically what you're likely to hear from the pulpit, what you're likely to hear taught. This is something the leadership is committed to. We teach in terms of this. We teach, I, I subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith, but someone can become a member and not subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith at all. In order to be a member here, you have to love Jesus, biblically defined. You have to love Jesus, and you need to be living an orderly Christian life. And that's it. So someone could be an Arminian, dispensational, charismatic Baptist and say, can I, can I join your church? And I would say, sure. I'm not sure if you're doing this because you're confused. <laughs> but you are, most, you are most welcome. You don't have to sign off on anything. You, you don't have to sign off on anything. All you have to do is love Jesus and be living an orderly life. Now, Obviously, if, if you're irritated every other Sunday beyond words by what's being said from here, we might want to help you find for your own peace of mind a, a place that's more conducive to what you want to do. But as far as we're concerned, everybody who loves Jesus, if Jesus is accepting of someone, then what business do we have to not be accepting of that person? Uh, are, are we supposed to have higher standards than the Lord does? Uh, if, you, if, if you find yourself having higher, what you call higher standards than the Lord does, then maybe you're doing it wrong. Another uh, thing, that, another characteristic or a feature of what is going on here is something we call Chestertonian Calvinism. Uh, and I want to explain that. We're followers of Christ alone. And so it may seem odd to describe one of the attitudes that we're seeking to cultivate here by using the names of two of the Lord's more notable servants, G.K. Chesterton and John Calvin. But that's all it is. It's an oddity. In Nehemiah, I just referred to this a week or so ago, Nehemiah 8.10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, 
Drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is not just an attitude that we have going into the fray. That joy is one of, one of our most formidable weapons. It's not something we fight for. It's something we're fighting with. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Our strength is found in the joy of the Lord. Now, this means that if you're not growing in cheerfulness, if you're not growing in cheerfulness, you're going to have genuine trouble fitting in. Now, by genuine cheerfulness, I don't mean doing cartwheels all day, every day, but it does mean that you're, you've become part of an extraordinarily cheerful community, and you, need, you really need to prepare yourself for that. This is an extraordinarily cheerful community. Now, it's not cheerful because we're not paying attention. It's not cheerful because we don't know the challenges we're up against. And it's not cheerful because we're somehow ignoring all the hard things that happen to different members of our congregation. You heard the prayer requests earlier this morning. There are some heavy burdens. The fact that we want to cultivate cheerfulness in the congregation, it, um, Paul says in Philippians, I've, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. This rejoicing is something we're commanded to do. We're also commanded to mourn with those who mourn, weep with those who weep. And those heavy burdens that we lifted up before the Lord, we really do want to lift them up before the Lord. But remember that the Apostle Paul knew how to be sorrowful, but always rejoicing. That's in 2 Corinthians 6.10. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We're not cheerful because we're delusional about the illnesses or the challenges or the cancer or the unexpected death or the financial difficulties. It's not that we're delusional about all of those things. We're told always and for everything in Ephesians, always and for everything, giving thanks. We want to give thanks. We want to rejoice always. We want to be cheerful and at the same time, as appropriate, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Think of it this way. Your afflictions, your afflictions, your troubles, your sorrows, our rich Palouse topsoil, in which the graces of Christ may grow. Your afflictions, all of them, your troubles, all of them, your difficulties, all of them, are rich black topsoil, in which the graces of Christ are growing and may grow. But down underneath is the bedrock, a thick layer of basalt and unmovable joy. That's what the soil has to rest on. The, the, the topsoil that you grow these graces in has to, has to sit on something, has to rest on something, and that is unshakable joy. Unshakable joy in the fact that God knows what he's doing, and he's our God. He's our God. He's in control. Our God is good. Our God is good all the time. Our God is our Father all the time. That's what the soil rests on. We go, through, we go through it like other people go through it. We have difficulties like other people have difficulties. Job says man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. We have troubles, right? We have troubles, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And that is why different people in the congregation can be going through an extraordinarily hard time, and yet the congregation as a whole remains a cheerful place to be. And so... You've heard it before, all of Christ for all of life. If there's one noticeable thing that is missing in our lost generation, it is the fact of identity. They have almost all of their old, established, and sometimes idolatrous identities smashed, and they have now been reduced to making up their own ad hoc identities as they go along, which is how we get bizarre manifestations of our father famine, things like trans communities. This is where these things come from. I, I identify as, right? I identify as. This is, speaking as a six foot 10 Chinese man, if I said, well, I don't get to speak as a six foot, six foot 10 Chinese man because that's not what God assigned to me. You don't get to identify as a, as a woman if you're a man. You don't get to identify as a man if you're a woman. You don't, get to change, you don't get to rearrange all that stuff. But the reason people want to rearrange all of it is all their old identities have been taken away, and they've been taken away because of the unrelenting war on fatherhood. Jesus is the one who brings us back to the Father, and that's the only way this particular Humpty Dumpty of a culture of ours is going to be put back together. Christ, we, we preach the message of a crucified and risen Christ. He is the only one who brings us back to the Father. 
I, I said earlier that, that our time is a time of acute, acute father famine. And, and so what, what do we do in a father famine? We preach Christ because he's the only one who can bring us back to the Father, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. When his disciples said, teach us how to pray, he said, when you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. Jesus brings us to the Father. Jesus is the answer to the Father famine, and the Father famine is the thing that's causing our, our culture to disintegrate. So he's the only one who can restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, as it says in Malachi 4, 6. So he is the risen one, and therefore the Lord of all. Jesus Christ was crucified in this world, and he was raised from the dead in this world. That's why he owns it. He owns it all because he rose from the dead in it. Anyone who rises from the dead in this world owns that world. He is the Lord extensively, and he is the Lord intensively. He is therefore, there is therefore nothing in this cosmos that he does not extend his scepter over. Our task is to fan out and claim it. We don't want to fan out so rapidly, so quickly, that we outrun our own headlights. We want to, we want to fan out deliberately, slowly, methodically, inexorably, and proclaiming in absolutely everything that we do that Christ is Lord. If you're an auto mechanic, you want to do that to the glory of God, proclaiming in your work that Christ is Lord. If you're a bookkeeper, you want to do your bookkeeping in such a way that proclaims, that preaches, that Christ is Lord. If you're doing law, you, if, if you're practicing law, you want to practice law in a way that proclaims Christ is Lord. If you're changing diapers, if you're washing dishes, if you are, um, if you're, whatever it is you, you set your hand to do, and you do it to glorify God, you are preaching the gospel in and through that. That's only possible, that, that can only be integrated or assembled together if worship is central, if it's central in an integrated way, if the way that everything comes together is with God's orderly um, handling of all the governments that he's established among men, and if we cooperate cheerfully with what he is doing. If that is the way it's being done, then we can stand back and say, this is not something we don't ever want to be like Nebuchadnezzar looking down at, say, is this not great Babylon that I've built, which is why God changed, gave him a period of lunacy, a period of madness, so that he might learn what the ground of all sanity is. Sanity is recognizing that God is God and God alone is God. Sanity is recognizing that God is manifested to us in Christ. And as we surrender all of that, and give all of that up to him. As we come to God, come back to our Father in the name of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, as we do that, he receives us and he knits us together. He receives us and he reassembles. He receives us and he puts everything that's out of joint back into joint. Everything that's dislocated is relocated. God is the one who does this, does this thing for us, does this marvelous thing for us. He's been doing it for us for four decades. He's been doing it, and we've seen it. We've, we see it coming together, and, and it is a marvelous thing in our eyes. And this is why we can point to this stone and say, this is the true Ebenezer stone. Our Father and God, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for all you've given to us. As we meditate on these things, I pray that you'd give us clarity of mind, cleanness of heart as we uh, look, look at what we ought to do, how we ought to respond. Father, as we do this, we would lift up to you the words that Jesus taught us how to pray, saying, As you know, this is a table of fellowship. This is a communion table, and this means that it's a weekly communion with Christ and his saints through the bread and wine, by the power of his spirit. But remember that Judas was at the first communion table, and what he was doing was not Christian fellowship. And there have been plenty of sons and daughters of Judas at communion tables ever since. But Judas doesn't happen out of nowhere. Being a hypocrite is not some kind of mystical secret. Hypocrisy manifests itself in rotten fruit. Jesus said that we can know someone by their fruit, and most importantly, we can know ourselves. And bramble bushes cannot produce real spiritual fruit. The Gospels tell us that Judas 
had been skimming off the top of the offering box for a while when he decided to betray Jesus. Any kind of appraisal of Judas's life could reveal the hypocrisy. Stealing is kind of a big deal. And it's right out there in the open. So what does this look like for us? Well, it would be something like speaking harshly to your wife and kids routinely, but constantly justifying it, calling it being manly. Or routinely harping on your husband and kids and having the audacity to call it spiritual concern. Or bad-mouthing your boss or taking advantage of your boss and, and then justifying it because he's been strict or harsh or letting your eyes and your mind wander in lust because you say, well, I'm not perfect, I'm just human. But you cannot have that sin and this table. What fellowship does light have with darkness? And the point is not that sinners cannot be forgiven or welcomed here. The point is that unrepentant sinners are being hypocrites by coming here. This is a table of fellowship and communion. This is a table for sinners. There are only sinners here, but it is a table for repentant sinners, for sinners who are running from their sin to Jesus their Savior. If that is you, then you are most welcome here. And we don't care if your sin was hounding you all the way to the door this morning. If you know you need mercy, then come. If you know you need grace, then come. If you know you're dirty, then come. If you know you're weak, then come. If the thought of having unconfessed sin makes you sick, come. If you know you have something you need to make right, then determine before God right now that you will go make it right as soon as you can, and then come. This table is for you. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. So let's give thanks together. Our God and Father, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that he died for our sins. Father, we thank you that he died not only for the sins that we knew about at the beginning, but he died, about, he died for all the sins we're just finding out about. He died for the sins that cling to us. He died for the sins that we tried to sweep under a rug or hide in a closet somewhere. Father, we thank you that he died for those and he died for those so that we might go free and so, Father, we thank you for setting us free to run to Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Having given thanks, Jesus broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. As Pastor Doug was talking this morning, uh, describing how Jesus puts us back together, I just have this uh, momentary parental um, you know, horror story in my mind. You think Christmas morning, you know, a number of Lego packages have been opened, but just imagine, you know, hundreds of new Lego packages opened and then just mixed together. <laughs> Some four-year-old just had fun. And that's like our lives. And then, and then Christ comes and says, but I know, I know what you're supposed to be. I know what you were made to be, and I know how all the pieces fit together. And that's the joy and the delight and the gift of living in this community is that Christ is putting us all back together, piece by piece, moment by moment. And that's the, that's the gift. That's the marvelous thing of being here. What, what's, what is this? What is he doing? What is it? It's Christ. It's Christ. That's, all, that's what we have. We have Christ. And he is putting us back together. He knows what we're for. And that's such a blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in your heart always. And amen.